Circle of Hope Network, doing life and being church together. Good morning to each of you, brothers and sisters. We have the faithful few here this morning, but it's important that we are here because God has brought us together at this camp meeting for a purpose. And I suspect that many of us are not even sure yet exactly what that purpose is, but God has a purpose. We have plans, we've prepared, and camp meeting is ready for you. But what God is going to do for each of us individually during this camp meeting, only he knows. Let's be open. Let's be open to him and let him work in our lives. The last time that I can think of that I was asked to speak at a camp meeting was about six years ago in the capital of Saudi Arabia, the city of Riyadh. And there we gathered with about 500 Seventh-day Adventist believers. That was the last camp meeting I spoke at. Mostly our Filipino brothers and sisters were there. This morning, I want to talk to you for a little bit about the hope that we have. We have a wonderful song in our hymnal number 214, We Have This Hope. But I want to share a short story with you before I begin. The great Russian composer Tchaikovsky was a quiet, a shy man who all his life had to contend with homesickness and stage fright. He had a very unhappy marriage and once became so desperate that he tried to commit suicide. Several years later, during an epidemic of cholera, he was in the city of St. Petersburg, Russia, and he was despondent after one of his symphonies was uh, poorly received by the public. And so while some of his friends looked on, he deliberately drank a glass of unboiled water. His friends were appalled. They said, you shouldn't drink that. There's cholera epidemic in the city. But he told them he was not afraid of cholera. He should have been. He died shortly after. How sad and tragic that the life of one of the world's leading musicians was snuffed out by such a fatalistic act. And yet there are people everywhere, people in our conference, people in our cities, people in our churches, who are slowly killing themselves because they've grown helpless and hopeless about their lives. They may not drink on boiled water, but they're killing themselves nonetheless by various means. Senseless risk-taking, unhealthy lifestyles, oppressive stress, and all of these because they've lost hope. There is good news. Do you believe there is good news this morning? There is good news this morning because the Bible is full of hope for those who will accept God's word by faith. There are a few promises I want to share with you. The first comes from Hebrews chapter 6 and verses 17 to 19. Hebrews 6, 17 to 19 says, In the same way, God, <clears throat> desiring even more to show to the heirs of the promise the unchangeableness of his purpose, interposed with an oath so that by two unchangeable things in which it is impossible for God to lie, we who have taken refuge would have strong encouragement to take hold of the hope set before us. This hope we have as an anchor of the soul, a hope both sure and steadfast, and one which enters within the veil. So what kind of hope does God offer? We could describe it in many ways, but I'll, I'll share these few things, I believe, about the hope that God offers to us. First of all, there is hope in the salvation of Christ that we have through the blood of Jesus, our Savior. According to Ephesians chapter 1 and verses 3 to 5, the Apostle Paul says, Blessed be God, the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places in Christ, just as he chose us in him before the foundation of the world, that we would be holy and blameless before him. In love, he predestined us to adoption as sons through Jesus 
Christ to himself according to the kind intention of his will. In Romans chapter 5, the first two verses, again Paul says, Therefore, having been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom also we have obtained our introduction by faith into this grace in which we stand, and we exult in the hope of the glory of God. There is also the hope of the resurrection. How many of you are thankful for the hope of the resurrection? I want to see your hands. How many of you have lost loved ones that you long to see again? You long to see there standing on the sea of glass or beside the river of life. In Romans 8, chapter 20, uh, verse 24 and 25, we read, For in hope we have been saved, but hope that is seen is not hope. For who hopes for what he already has, for what he already sees? But if we hope for what we do not see, with perseverance we wait eagerly for it. If you'll turn over just a few chapters, the first Corinthians chapter 15, verses 51 to 52 say, Behold, I tell you a mystery, we shall not all sleep, but we will all be changed in a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trumpet, for the trumpet will sound and the dead will be raised imperishable, and we will be changed. Then there's the hope, very closely tied together with the hope of the resurrection, the hope of the second coming of Jesus Christ, who will bring all these things to fruition. That blessed hope, Titus 2, verses 11 to 14. For the grace of God has appeared, bringing salvation to all men, instructing us to deny ungodliness and worldly desires and to live sensibly, righteously, and godly in this present age, looking for the blessed hope and the appearing of the glory of our great God and Savior, Christ Jesus, who gave himself for us to redeem us from every lawless deed and to purify for himself a people for his own possession, zealous for good deeds. So we have this hope. We have this hope in various uh, forms. Hope of salvation in Christ, hope of the resurrection, hope of his second coming. And there are many more that we could look at. But the real question that I want to ask you this morning, do you, do I, offer the hope that we have to others around us? What are we doing with the hope within us? We have this hope. We sing about it joyously. We love to talk about the blessed hope. But what are we doing with it? Are we keeping it to ourselves? There is what some call the fortress mentality, and they believe the church should be a fortress, like a mighty, a mighty uh, fortress on a hill, safe and secure from the world and its influence, and through those cold stone walls no one shall pass. Is that the church? Others say the church should be like a salt shaker, and the salt that God has given us to season the world should be sprinkled out of the salt shaker, out of us, to our friends and neighbors, co-workers. Well, I think to some extent I would be ready to say that to some extent we can be a fortress, and that is the fundamental teachings of our church we need to be able to stand for, protect, defend, but we need to do a much better job of sprinkling salt around us. We're very good at protecting ourselves and insulating ourselves from the influence of the world too many times. It's okay to protect ourselves from the evil, but it's not okay to isolate ourselves from those whom we are in this world to seek and to save. Psalm 92 verse 12 says, The righteous man will flourish like the palm tree, and he will grow like the cedar in Lebanon. Well, my wife and I have lived and worked in places where we saw both the palm tree in the desert 
as well as the cedars in Lebanon. If you've never been to Lebanon, I would encourage you to go make a visit sometime. The cedars there are beautiful. There are about three preserves in Lebanon that have cedars that have been untouched through the centuries. I don't know exactly how old they are. I, uh, when I look at, uh, at the science, the biologists, they say that those trees can, be, can grow to 1,500 to 2,000 years old. Although if you go there, there are people with their little souvenir shops at the entrance to the parks, and they'll tell you that they're over 5,000 years old. However old they are, probably some of them were standing when Christ was walking on the earth, not so far away from there. But I want to take a little look at the palm tree. I'm not going to spend so much time with the cedars of Lebanon, beautiful as they are. How many of you have been to a desert country? Are there any of you who have been to a desert country? I see a few hands. Okay. Well, we were privileged to spend a few years working in the Middle East. And uh, for a time, we lived in the United Arab Emirates, which is a desert country. It borders with the country of Oman. It borders Saudi Arabia. And uh, driving on those beautiful highways that they have, four-lane, six-lane, eight-lane highways, ten-lane highways through the desert, and you see nothing but sand. You could drive for hours in some places. Nothing but sand and heat. Now, I don't really get along with heat too well. You can see I don't have a jacket on. I hope you don't mind. I hope that's not too offensive to you. But I've lived uh, for 11 or 12 years in hot climates, which I never really liked anyway. Even when I was living in the States, I never really liked the summers. It was my least favorite season. But over there, I can tell you, the heat is sometimes almost unbearable. So you're more, probably more used to the Celsius uh, system of measuring temperature. But I've seen temperatures in the upper 40s to low 50s uh, fairly frequently. And the only, if you want to go to the Gulf region like Dubai and some of those places, the best time of year to go, I will tell you, is in December or January when you might have a high temperature of about... Um, 25, or even 20 if you're lucky. Other than that, it's going to be hot. And so you can drive for hours and hours and see nothing but sand and sand dunes. And sometimes the sand will drift across the road and cause accidents. You know, on a, on a high-speed highway, to have an inch or two of sand suddenly drifted across the road causes those wheels to act differently. And... Uh, you have to be cautious with that. You have to watch out for camels that may sometimes cross the road. And there's uh, two reasons for that. One is uh, camels can kill you if you hit them. They're kind of like moose. They have long legs and a heavy body in the middle. And uh, when you hit those legs, it gets knocked out from under them, and the body comes through the windshield. I remember hearing about a family of six people that were driving in a, in a land cruiser and hit a camel. No one walked away alive. All died. It was a horrible thing. But here in, the, in that desert, there is a certain beauty. And during the months of December and January, you might even get a little rain shower. We've seen a few of those rain showers. Sometimes there might be three or four in a, in a month. Uh, that might last 10 minutes or might be 30 minutes. I've seen it rain hard enough that you could get soaked and need an umbrella. But it doesn't last very long. But curiously enough, a few days after that rain, as you're driving along the highway, you're looking at those sand dunes along the side, and there's a little different tint to them. You see just a slightest bit of tint of green, and you think, is that my imagination? But if you pull over to the side and you go walk and look, there's a little bit of grass starting to grow. It doesn't last long, a few days, a week or two at the most, and then, of course, it's burned up by the sun. But it's curious to see what will grow in the desert. But if you could imagine yourself now, a traveler in the desert, and you didn't have these big highways, you were walking, 
walking over the sand dunes up and down and you're trying to get to a destination, meet somebody, uh, had an appointment, whatever, you had a distance to go and you were, you packed your food, you packed your water and you started out bravely into the sun and uh, made, made your way across the desert, up and down, sliding down the sand dunes on the one side and climbing up the other. Climbing in sand is not easy, is it? If you've ever done it, it's not easy. But then after a few hours, you know, your food's kind of run low and your water is running out and you're wondering, ah, how much farther do I have to go? After a little while longer, your water's gone. And I can tell you, without water in the desert, no one lives. Nothing lives without water. Your mouth, your lips are parched. Your tongue is beginning to stick to the roof of your mouth. And you can't swallow. There's nothing to swallow. <clears throat> your walking has been reduced almost to crawling up and down those dunes. Hoping and praying now, not just to find your destination, but that you'll survive. And just imagine climbing over that one sand dune as you look ahead, you can see in the distance what looks like a grove, a little, a little oasis, a cluster of palm trees. You know that where the palm tree grows, there is water. And so you redouble your efforts and you make every strenuous effort possible to make it over to that little oasis. And you finally make it, and sure enough, there's a little pool of water around which these palm trees are growing. Palm trees don't necessarily have to have a pool of water to grow because they strike roots fairly deep, and they will find some water to survive in many locations. It would look like there's no water around. But there you find water. Your life is not lost. You are able to survive. I shared that as an illustration with you because it is an important illustration in the sense that you and I are like that palm tree. Isn't that what David said? Psalm 92, 12, the righteous man will flourish like the palm tree. So if we're like the palm tree, in what way? How can we be like the palm tree? Do we offer hope to the weary travelers through this world? Do we offer them something that quickens their nerves and quickens their heart and gives them some courage to go on? Do we offer them any encouragement? I'd like to share with you a couple of paragraphs from the book In Heavenly Places where Ellen White has this to say, as is the palm tree in the desert, a guide and consolation to the fainting traveler, so the Christian is to be in the world. He is to guide weary souls full of unrest and ready to perish in the desert of sin to the living water. He is to point to his fellow men, to him who gives to all the invitation, if any man thirst, let him come to me and drink. The sky may be as brass, the burning sand may beat about the palm tree's roots and pile itself about its trunk, Yet the tree lives on fresh and vigorous. Remove the sand and you discover the secret of his life. Its roots strike down deep into waters hidden in the earth. And thus it is with the Christian. His life is hid with Christ in God. Jesus is to him a well of water springing up into everlasting life. His faith, like the rootlets of the palm tree, penetrates beneath the things that are seen drawing life from the fountain of life. And amid all the corruption of the world, he is true and loyal to God. The sweet influence of Christ's righteousness surrounds him. In Matthew 5, verse 13, Jesus said, You are the salt of the earth. But if the salt has become tasteless, how can it be made salty again? It is no longer good for anything except to be thrown out and trampled underfoot by men. So whether we look at the church as a fortress or a salt shaker, we have to ask ourselves the question, what are we doing with the hope that lies within us? Are we sharing it? 
Are we willing to get out of our comfort zone and share? If we're not, brothers and sisters, we're just playing games in church. If that's what we're doing, unless we wake up out of our sleep, we'll not see the pearly gates. Ellen White wrote in Heavenly Places, page 318. I'm going to close with this statement. A true, lovable Christian is the most powerful argument that can be advanced in favor of Bible truth. Did you catch that? Not those that are able to expound from their Bibles all the wonders of the prophecies of Daniel and Revelation, not the ones that can find all the texts, the proof texts that we have for our beliefs. No, the most powerful argument that can be advanced in favor of the Bible truth is a true, lovable Christian. She goes on to say that such a man is Christ's representative. His life is the most convincing evidence that can be borne to the power of divine grace. When God's people bring the righteousness of Christ into the daily life, sinners will be converted and victories over the enemy will be gained. Is that your desire? Are you willing to let him use you? Whether he uses you to talk to a neighbor across the fence or around the corner? A colleague at your workplace? Are you willing to let your light shine? Let the salt be sprinkled? Let people see that there's something refreshing about you? Like the palm tree indicates there's water, there's a source of life. And if they're thirsty, they're going to want to come. They're going to be attracted to you. May God help us. Are you willing to let Jesus know this morning that you're ready to begin your life anew with him today? That you're ready to let him show you opportunities and help you to step out of your comfort zone and share with someone else what you have? the blessed hope. Are you willing? If you are, please stand with me. Our kind and gracious Father, we come to you this morning thanking you for the good night's rest we had, thanking you for the message of the word, thanking you, Lord, for our lives, for the hope that we have within us through Jesus Christ. Thank you so much for what you've done for us. I pray that you'll give us also the gift of forgiveness. Oftentimes we do not value the gift we've been given. We do not take advantage of it. We do not share what we have with others. We over, we're overjoyed with the blessings that we receive through Jesus Christ and through the gospel, but we become selfish and we hoard it to ourselves, to our own hurt, in fact. It is not a blessing to us when we're not sharing it. Each of these brothers and sisters who have stood this morning at this early hour have committed themselves to allowing you to work in their lives, to show them opportunities, Lord, what they can do to meet, to talk with, to pray for, and simply just to love so that others may be blessed. And when the kingdom is established forever on this earth, Jesus returns with all his holy angels. And we're established on this earth forever, never to be parted again. May we find that we will have many friends and neighbors there that we knew on this earth, that through our lives and our influence, our cheerfulness, our happiness, our helpfulness, they will be there too to enjoy all eternity. This is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Circle of Hope Network, doing life and being church together.